Okay, hello, this is video lecture number 53. Uh, today's lecture is titled, The Republican Vision. We are now uh, kind of moving onward from this reconstruction phase and into a new era in American history. Uh, we have two subsections that we're covering today. Uh, the first is integrating the national economy, and the second is the new union and the world. So if the reconstruction of the South divided the nation, the expansion into the West had the opposite effect. It united Americans, Northerners and Southerners alike. Uh, the West was a region that promised the country not only new lands to settle uh, and abundant natural resources to exploit, but the West also promised a war-weary nation a fresh start, a second chance, if on terms dictated by the victorious North. Perhaps nothing better symbolized this new era than the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. The Union Pacific Railroad and the Central Pacific Railroad began this epic construction project in 1863 in the very midst of the Civil War and finished the railroad six years later. The nation was now bound together uh, from sea to sea, not only by steel and steam, but also by a singleness of purpose. On May 10th of 1869, Alexander Topance, a pioneer, witnessed the historic occasion at Promontory, Utah. Okay, so let's look closer at the Republican vision uh, with our first section, Integrating the National Economy. Reshaping the former Confederacy after the war accompanied a Republican drive to strengthen the national economy to overcome limitations of market fluctuations that took place under previous democratic regimes. Failure to fund internal improvements left different regions of the country disconnected, uh, producing the Civil War, or that's what Republicans argued. During the Civil War and after, the Republican-dominated Congress made vigorous use of federal power, uh, passing protective tariffs that gave U.S. manufacturers a competitive advantage against foreign firms. Republican administrations would strengthen the economy through a massive public-private partnership that modern historians argue represents a turn away from laissez-faire or hands-off approach uh, of previous administrations toward the economy. The government is becoming more involved in regulating business. Railroad developments in the United States began well before the Civil War but peaked after the Civil War. By 1900, virtually no corner of the country lacked rail service. Railroads transformed American capitalism by adopting a legal form of organization called the corporation, uh, enabling them to raise private capital in large amounts. They were getting very rich. Along with the transformative power of railroads, Republicans' protective tariffs also helped uh, to build thriving U.S. industries. A Civil War debt existed uh, in the range of $2.8 billion. Uh, that was erased during the 1880s um, from tariffs. Fierce tariff debates uh, went on then to mark American politics in the 1880s and 90s. Democrats argued that the tariff had not slowed poverty in the U.S. So Democrats were against these tariffs. Uh, protective tariffs had also helped to foster the growth of things called trusts. These are giant corporations that dominated entire sectors of the economy and they wielded monopoly power. Now the rise of railroads and trusts prompted a pushback by companies against new state and federal regulatory laws. In Munn v. Illinois, 1877, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that states possessed the right to regulate businesses, but not at the expense of fragmenting the national marketplace. In the Southwest, federal courts promoted economic development at the expense of racial justice. Although the United States had taken control of New Mexico and Arizona after the U.S.-Mexican War of 1848, much of the land still remained in Mexican-American hands by the 1870s. As the post-Civil War years brought railroads and Anglo-American settlers, Mexican-Americans went on to lose about 64% of their lands through special courts that ruled on land titles. Now, something called the Santa Fe Ring existed. It was a notorious group of politicians and lawyers who conspired 
to defraud Mexican Americans of their lands. After the Civil War also, U.S. and European policymakers attempted to transform their economies to something called the gold standard. But basing money supplies on gold was a divisive issue that framed U.S. politics for more than a generation. In 1873, Congress directed the U.S. Treasury over a six-year period to retire the greenback paper dollars issued during the Civil War and replace them with notes from an expanded system of national banks. After 1879, the Treasury exchanged notes for gold upon request. Silver adherents received a modest victory when Congress passed the Bland-Allison Act of 1878, requiring the United States to coin a modest amount of silver. Republican nationalist policies fostered rapid economic growth in the form of an expansion of telecommunications, uh, growing corporations and capital, and this went on to make the United States a mighty industrial power by 1900. All right, our next section is the new union and the world. Following the Civil War, the United States achieved greater leverage with foreign nations like Britain. Uh, American expansionists expected to add more territories to the nation. The use of the Hawaiian Islands and the invention of steam transportation facilitated expansion off the continent to places like Japan in the 1850s. Union victory also increased trade with Latin America. Uh, Mexico freed itself from French rule in 1867, but risked economic manipulation by its larger northern neighbor, the United States. International trade became a new model then for asserting power in Latin America and in Asia. Under the, under the leadership of Secretary of State William Seward, uh, the United States embraced China and Japan, forcing the Japanese to remain open to trade. Seward also advocated the purchase of strategic locations for naval bases and refueling stations, such as land in Nicaragua for a canal, uh, Hawaii, and the Philippines. In 1868, Seward achieved a significant victory with congressional approval of the Burlingame Treaty with China. Uh, which regulated immigration. The same year, Seward also purchased Alaska from Russia, uh, further establishing the United States as a global power. All right, this is it for video lecture number 53. Um, we have the United States now becoming uh, more involved in the international community as it emerges from the crisis of the Civil War. So, at this time, please answer the review questions that you see at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.